Lowe's starts right now. Bear County commissioners approved another one and a half million dollars in grant money this morning for small business owners. That's after the more than five million in loans and grants they approved in March has been used up. And as Garrett Berger tells us, even more money could be on the way. For Stephanie Garza, a $5,000 grant has helped her dog care and training company, Pup Pup and Away, weather the pandemic. It's very nice to have that, that cushion there. Most of it will go towards rent, and then a little bit will go over for that uh, payroll as well. Hers was one of the 300-plus businesses able to get help through the original round of loans and grants, using Bear County money administered by Lyft Fund. Most of it was loan money, with only a quarter million for grants. And that went quickly to just 52 businesses. And within three days, we were oversubscribed. The, the $250,000 became closer to uh, almost a million dollars in requests. But this time, the one and a half million is all for grants for businesses with five or fewer employees. If we talk about 10, 000, up to 10,000 per small business, that's 150 small businesses that we can help right away. The county also had $5 million that it planned to use for loans. But because this is money from the CARES Act, they say they can't use it that way. If you think about a loan, eventually it's going to get paid back. And uh, these dollars were really intended to go and help uh, the businesses in need today. So instead, that $5 million might also be used for more grants. When, but the county still needs to come up with a plan. We Commissioners have, have also asked to make sure there's the equitable distribution with this round of money. We need to have the balance in the precincts because every precinct is paying into it but not getting equal numbers. But business owners will have time to prepare. Lift Fund doesn't expect this round of grants to open up until June. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. We got some late breaking news in the battle over voting by mail here in Texas. A federal judge granting the Texas Democratic Party's motion for a preliminary injunction that would enable counties to permit the use of absentee ballots due to the coronavirus pandemic. That prevents Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton from threatening the prosecution of voters. Judge Fred Beery in his ruling wrote that, quote, Americans now seek life without fear of pandemic, liberty to choose their leaders in an environment free of disease and the pursuit of happiness without undue restrictions, end quote. Throughout the country and here in San Antonio, reports show that black people are dying at much higher rates than white people from the coronavirus, even though health officials say the ethnicity alone doesn't play a role in how the virus affects the human body. Devin Clark sat down with a Metro health official to explore the possible reasons for the disparities. Last Friday, San Antonio officials reported that among COVID-19 cases here in the city, 194 or just under 10 percent were black or African-American and 482 cases or just under 25 percent were white or Caucasian. However, blacks or African-Americans accounted for 24 percent of COVID-19 related deaths, while whites accounted for 21 percent. Black and brown people and especially black people are disproportionately affected and it goes back to those social determinants of health. Medical director for San Antonio Metro Health, Dr. June DeWu, says the virus itself does not affect victims based on ethnicity. However, there are other non-physiological factors contributing to the mortality rates. Sometimes people are living in more dense areas with multi-generational families. Dr. Wu says more crowded living environments can make it harder to social distance and avoid the virus. That includes jail and prison. That's disproportionately impacting our black and brown communities. So we know that we've had these outbreaks at the jail. Additionally, Dr. Wu says many working minorities are frontline and essential workers, which creates greater opportunity to be exposed. On the other hand, she says there are many others who don't have access to health care. I mean, there is a transportation issue, but also there's, you know, do I, do I realize that I need care? Do I have health insurance? For some, Dr. Wu says it could all boil down to minorities not being able to find a provider that they feel comfortable with. I know that African-American male physicians, that number has only decreased over time instead of increasing like you would have expected. Dr. Wu says no matter your ethnicity, social distancing, wearing masks, and not touching your face with unclean hands are still the best lines of defense against contracting the coronavirus. But if you do get sick, she says your chances of recovering are much greater if you get medical help quickly. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Eviction proceedings can legally resume across Texas today, but it will likely be a couple of more weeks before these type of cases actually go before judges in Bear County. That gives renters a bit more time to try and come up with help. Officials with the city's Neighborhood and Housing Services Department say more than 7,600 people have applied for assistance since mid-March, an exponential increase compared to normal times. 
Single parent Jessica Lorma secured rental help from a local charity only to still get a notice to vacate from her far north side apartment complex. I rarely feel like that, but right now it's it's defeat and frustration. People renting homes or apartments that are backed by federal loans are allowed to stay through August 23rd. While city and county businesses are reopening, district courts are about to get back in business too. Officials say it will be a cumbersome, complex, and a time-consuming process. Paul Venema reports that the target date for beginning that process is right around the corner. Getting the central jury room and district courtrooms ready is the first order of business from seating to meeting Metro Health Department guidelines. The target date for opening is June 1st. We want to make sure that all the protocols are in place before we open. That's why it's difficult for me to give a date. Those protocols, which Ronhell outlined in a PowerPoint presentation for state district judges, include replacing cloth chairs, setting up social distance seating arrangements, and limiting the number of prospective jurors. And it'll be a while before those jurors will receive a summons. It's very possible that the, the jury summons won't be received by anybody till the end of July, early August, late August, even into September. He said because of the limited number of prospective jurors in the central jury room due to social distancing guidelines, the jury selection process for trials must change. The courts are going to have to alternate, sort of take turns, work together to make sure that we can, we can have the jury trials that we need. This is really going to have a major impact on judicial efficiency, isn't it? it it's a very difficult proposition, and our numbers keep rising. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. You can expect to pay more for that next barbecue plate or smoked brisket. While most restaurants have been hit hard the past two months, barbecue restaurants are really feeling the heat. Supply chain issues have driven up beef, pr beef prices, especially high demand brisket. Barbecue restaurants we checked with say they are paying double for a pound of prime brisket compared to just a couple of weeks ago. And many say they simply have to pass along at least some of that increased cost. Everything's gone up a little bit, but brisket's been the, is outrageous, and brisket's half the meat we sell. We had to go up on our price a little bit, but we're making far less money at our higher price now than I was three weeks ago at a much lower price. We actually checked with about a dozen restaurants around town. We found you can expect to pay from one to five dollars more per pound of prime brisket compared to just a couple of weeks ago. As processing plant issues resolve, those prices should begin to come down. Take a look now at your time saver traffic and the roadways out there. This is a shot of I-10 and 1604 on the northwest side. As Steve mentioned yesterday, this is kind of a similar scene that we've been seeing for the past several weeks. Not a whole lot going on in that direction. Yeah, not the normal picture of yeah. 10 west at 1604, that's for sure. Well, in a given year, 18% of the U.S. population will struggle with anxiety. 7% will have at least one major depressive episode. With the current COVID pandemic, those numbers may skyrocket. Ursula Perry now with how and where people can turn for help. The impact of the tremendous stress on state health services is being noticed. The governor today encouraging those overwhelmed to reach out and seek help. Uh, concerns to panic to mental health challenges, whatever the case may be, uh, they can call uh, the Department of State Health Services or look at, look at them online uh, and check out the ability uh, for them to be able to provide services for you. The experts say in the meantime, don't fall into an unhealthy rut. Having a routine and having a schedule in place is really important. Take a shower each morning, get out of your sleepwear, dress even if you aren't leaving the house. And when negative thoughts come your way, take a minute in your day, reflect on that thought that you just had, and then ask yourself, how can I turn this into something that's positive and find a way to spin it positively? If someone in your household is struggling with anxiety and you see them spacing out or distancing themselves from the rest of the group, it's important to break that unhealthy cycle. They really need a little hand getting pulled out. They're not gonna naturally come out a lot of times. So just interrupting that train of thought. As for friends and family who don't live with you? Reaching out to them is fine. The phone still works, Skype still works. If you need to talk to a professional, most insurance companies will now honor teletherapy sessions during the COVID-19 pandemic. Call your insurance provider to make sure you're covered. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. 
time now to take a live look outside with live cam. Adam called it. It was going to be a hot one today, and boy, did Mother Nature deliver yeah. on that. Yeah. And 96 the high temperature today, so we're feeling the heat out there, but uh, not not even close to the record of 101. So that record still stands. The aquifer, it's up a little bit today. It's nice to see that, and we are just barely below the May average now at 665.4. So the recent rain has definitely staved off the stage one restrictions for the time being. Mold is high at nearly 1700. Our high was 96 after a low of 72 today. Our temperatures will be dropping in the days ahead as rain chances are on the rise. We'll talk more about that coming right up. Coming up tonight on the night beat, the difficult changes some daycares are being forced to make following the governor's new guidelines. All right, we are awaiting the daily briefing from City Hall with San Antonio's mayor as well as Bear County Commissioner, Bear County Judge, rather, Nelson Wolf. Uh, it will be interesting because we will get the numbers, of course, mm -hmm. uh, of positive cases. I also expect to hear from either the mayor or the county judge on the ruling that just came down from the federal district court here judge about Nelson the mail-in ballots. Let's listen in. City attorney Andy Segovia, along with our district attorney, Jill Gonzalez, they'll both be here to answer questions about the local emergency orders that the judge and I signed today. This is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight, uh, we have 2,278 total confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Bear County. This is an increase of 65 from yesterday. We also do have some new information of the cases that came in over the weekend, uh, including those tonight. We have 23 from the community, community spread. We have five from the jail, that includes four inmates and one staff. We have seven that are classified from other congregate settings and 51 that are pending investigations, meaning that their contact tracing investigations are still underway. We are thankful to not have any new deaths to report tonight, so we remain at 62. I do want to make note that we have uh, been aggressively increasing increasing our testing capacity. Last night, I mentioned that we were up to 3,000, which was our benchmark from the health transition team. Our testing capacity here in Bear County now is actually 3,960, and that includes all the labs, public and private, that are available to our community. I do want to also make mention that our positivity rate in cases has declined for the fourth, uh, excuse me, for the third week in a row. Last week, uh, and that was the week ending Friday last, was a three and a half percent uh, positivity rate for tests conducted in Bear County. That's compared to 4.3 from the week before, both of those notable decreases from when we started this process. Uh, on our hospitals, we continue to uh, see a slight increase in the numbers, and again, we've got to look at all of these in context. We have 80 COVID positive patients in the local hospitals, another 20 patients that are under investigation for COVID, for a total of 100 potential COVID patients in our hospitals tonight. Again, those numbers have gone up modestly over the last few days. 35 patients are in ICU and 20 patients tonight are in ventilators. As far as our capacity goes, that makes for 78% of our ventilator capacity and 30% of our staffed hospital beds currently available to us. As part of the recommendations of our COVID-19 health and economic transition team report, the group of experts that was guiding us as a community to open up safely. Uh, I do want to make mention one of the main recommendations of the economic team was to provide for safety supplies and processes to allow our small businesses and nonprofits to open effectively and open safely. So working with the county and the city, we've, we've put together supply kits for small businesses that includes things like thermometers, hand sanitizers, face masks, and other forms of PPE. The San Antonio business community, of course, has shown some remarkable resiliency, creativity, and adaptability to the challenges that this pandemic has, has forced us to face. And so these kits are going to be available by registering on our website. You can go to covid19.sanantonio.gov slash reopening. Qualifying participants are those businesses of 25 employees or fewer. They can register on the website and be able to pick those supply kits up on 
May 27th. That's next Wednesday at the Alamo Dome. So uh, please get in line. Make sure you can get those uh, those uh, kits to make sure that you can open up effectively. You can also call 311 between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. to get registered. I'll turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thank, thanks about the kits. Uh, we I think we bought 2,000 of them. We've had 1,000 uh, written requests already uh, signed up, and then we're making sure they're qualified so they can pick them up at the uh, at the courthouse uh, which for employees of employers that have 25 people or less. Then Commissioner Calvert's delivering some directly to some businesses in his district, and then we're going to be distributing them through the uh, various suburban cities as we go along. So another step to uh, help protect the employers, uh, employees as well as uh, people doing business with them. Now, I don't want you to tell Tracy, but I had uh, – a plate of enchiladas today at the Blanco Cafe. They were great. And uh, again, it's a locally owned uh, restaurant and they were doing everything exactly right uh, in terms of the mask and in terms of spacing everybody out. There's a little confusing over the um, governor's order. I had a letter today from the Tobin Center. If 3,000 people can go to church, uh, why can't uh, people come to the Tobin Center, which has only 1,700? So we're going to write a little letter to see if we can get some clarification on that. Um, we're doing better at the better at the jail now. Uh, we've had, I think, a total of 397 that tested positive, but only five of them are females, and that's now down to only 321 that do have it. Uh, we've done 1,618 test results. The interesting thing about this is, though, and I'm not quite sure, I know I don't understand it, 78 of them were symptomatic, but 319 had no symptoms. And uh, I, I don't know why, but that's the way it's coming out there. Uh, we only have 13 in the infirmary and none in the uh, in the hospital. But we're, what we're facing problems on our jail population is increasing, and that means we're going to have more cases. Uh, what we're having terrible troubles with the state, as we do on most cases. Uh, the state hospital system no longer is accepting inmates found incompetent to stand trial. There are 98 of them in our jail waiting for transfer to the state mental health facility. The prison system is not accepting inmates from jails. We now have uh, 228 of them in the jail. Uh, the governor uh, changed the rules on who can have a, a personal recognizance bond. And that's led to another 244 individuals in the jail. So we're getting jammed up, which means it's going to be a lot of trouble down the line. And if we can just get the state uh, to meet their responsibilities, that would be a big step forward. There's some good news on the uh, vaccine. My data <coughs> incorporated out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, did their uh, first study that they completed. And they did find that uh, some of the... Uh, uh, people that were not symptomatic were tested to see if the vaccine would work, and it did work. It induced an immune response. So that's preliminary, just the start of it, uh, but a good indication they're going to be able to f finally come up with a vaccine. Great. Thank you, Judge. As always, you can get the latest on COVID-19 in our community by going to covid19.sanantonio.gov, or you can text COSAGOV to 55000. We do have our legal legals here from the city and the county, and we'll be happy to take any questions. I noticed that in this order that the date for the eviction all right, you could hear both the uh, county judge and the mayor talking about the fact that they have extended the stay home work safe order to June 4th. Uh, of course, that means, you know, just a lot of what we've been doing so far. They're encouraging people to stay home, encouraging people to wear face coverings if you're 10 years or older. Uh, the number's up about 65 today, but the good news, no new deaths to report. Yeah, we are standing at 62 on that front. The mayor also did mention that we are aggressively increasing our testing. Yesterday, we were at 3,000. Today, we stand at almost 4,000, 3,960 tests. And the positivity rate is declining for the third week in a row. So certainly good news for us here in the community. Yeah, also talked about uh, these kits mm -hmm. that they'll give out to small businesses and nonprofits. Of, I believe it was 25 people or fewer, or fewer. Uh, that includes PPE, personal protective equipment, thermometers, things like that. They also talked, the judge talked a little bit about their greater, safer together initiative with local businesses, having people take the pledge. And he said so far about a thousand businesses have done that. And actually we'll talk with infectious disease doctor from UT Health San Antonio, Dr. Ruth Bergren about that very order coming up a little bit later in this newscast. All right, turning now to weather, 95 degrees out there, Adam, very hot outside. Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, the heat high, it's been in control of our weather today, but it's not going to stay in control of our weather the rest of this week. It's going to break down and that's going to open the door for some storm chances. First, let's take a look at the temperatures across the state. Look at that. We topped out at 96 here in San Antonio, San Angelo tied a record. Del Rio had a record of 108. Right now they're at 107. And by the way, the 108 in Del Rio is the second highest May reading on record in Del Rio. All right, taking a look at other readings at the moment. 102 Abilene, Junction 99, Laredo 102. A lot of the heat is right here in South Texas with Carrizo Springs at 104. So we're in the 90s right now. Temperatures will be falling off through the evening and tomorrow. I still think we'll make it into the mid 90s, about 94 the high temperature Thursday and Friday near 90 and then into the weekend. We see those temperatures fall off into the 80s for afternoon highs. So as those temperatures drop a bit, I do think our rain chances will be on the rise. Not necessarily right now, it's just in the days ahead. We have some activity in West Texas. That's not going to affect us tonight. Still big blue H heat high in control here. That will be breaking down though. And as it does so, well, our rain chances will be at about 30% for Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Then we boost it a little bit by Sunday and Monday with the potential of increasing these storm chances even more for Sunday and even on into Memorial Day. If things stay on track as the way they're looking, I wouldn't be surprised if we increase those numbers by tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening. So 72 in the morning tomorrow, 94 in the afternoon. After some morning clouds, we'll have a lot of sunshine and then just daily isolated pop up showers and storms uh, possible through the remainder of the work week and into the weekend. All right, some more rain would be great. Thanks so much, Adam. All right, there are a lot of things that happen during a lockout, but LeBron James wearing the silver star would be weird. What are the chances he'd become a Dallas Cowboy? That was talked about on a podcast. When we come back, did he even have a contract from Jerry Jones? The answer is actually yes. And when we come back, the NBA lottery is supposed to be tonight. What the Spurs lottery chances if it were held, which it won't be. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. LeBron James playing for the Dallas Cowboys. The NBA superstar has admitted that he seriously considered playing professional football during the NBA lockout in 2011. That revelation was made during the podcast on Uninterrupted with Paul Rivera and Maverick Carter. You see, LeBron was an all state receiver in his sophomore and junior season in high school, and many, including now Clippers head coach Doc Rivers, believe he had the talent to play professional football. And James even changed his workouts to get in football shape. We started to clock our times with the 40s. We started to add a little bit more in our bench presses and things of that nature. We started to add more sled into our to our agenda with our with our uh, workouts. And uh, you know, Mike kept talking about you know it'd be great to go down to Irvine, Texas. Did you get the call from Bron saying, "Hey, I might want to do this"? <laughs> I did not, but I know he got a contract from Jerry Jones uh, that he framed and put in his office. Ah, but unfortunately, the podcast moved to another subject before any amount of the contract was revealed. But at six foot eight and 250 pounds, James would have been a very imposing player in the NFL. As it turns out, the lockout ended in December of that year, and LeBron would go on to win the MVP as well as the NBA championship and the NBA Finals MVP, defeating Oklahoma City in five games with the Heat. Tom Brady is already working out with some of his new teammates during the COVID-19 shutdown. Despite being saddled with virtual meetings, Brady managed to get together with center Ryan Jensen and wide receivers Mike Evans and Scotty Miller. To to go along with tight ends Cam Braid and O.J. Howard, to name a few. That's according to the Tampa Bay Times. It posted pictures of the players working out in a two-hour throwing session taking place at Berkeley Preparatory School. Now the school is closed to students, but is allowing players to work out under Florida's social distancing rules allow groups of under 10 people. NFL team facilities are right now closed to players and coaches, are only open to players needing rehab from injuries, and some staff starting today. But the NFL says so long as the local guidelines are followed, those workouts can take place. Former UTSA Trinity and UIW head coach Ken Burmeister has passed away due to cancer. A college basketball coach for 21 years, Ken took the Roadrunners to their first ever appearance in the NCAA tournament in 1988, where they lost to Illinois. After taking over Loyola in 1994, he went on to coach at Trinity University for one season for taking over the Cardinals for 12 years. Ken Burmeister leaves us at the age of 72.
The NBA draft lottery was supposed to play, take place tonight, but like everything else in the NBA, that is now on hold with no definite new date in sight, as it appears impossible at this point to finish the entire 82-game regular season schedule due to the suspension of play. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, team executives still expect the same format to take place when the lottery is actually held. If that's the case and no other regular season games are held in right now, the teams are the best shot at the number one pick in the NBA draft for the Golden State Warriors and Cleveland Cavaliers of Minnesota Timberwolves, all with the three worst Worst records. The Warriors, Cavs, and Wolves would have a 14% chance at landing the number one pick. Atlanta and Detroit to follow at 12.5 and 10.5% respectively. So here's the top five. If the, if the lottery was actually held today, Golden State, Cleveland, and Minnesota were the best shot, followed by Atlanta and Detroit. Here's the second half of the top 10. And you can see it would be New York, Chicago, Charlotte, Washington, Phoenix, and San Antonio would check in with a shot at the top lottery pick at number 11 at 2%. But that all depends on just what happens the rest of this season. So you're saying we got a shot. We have a shot. <laughs> Very <laughs> Thank slim. You. Thank you. Sure. We'll be right back. It's our time for coronavirus Q&A, where we talk to experts and try to separate the facts from the fear that surround COVID-19. We are joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Dr. Bergeron, I really appreciate you being here. There are a lot of things that are have opened. Gyms opened. Technically, we're allowed to open yesterday on Friday. Bars will open. What's your advice to people out there who are going back to some of these places? What should they be looking at? Yeah. Well, first of all, be very, very careful. Um, don't be lulled into a false sense of security. It's not as though the virus has gone away or become less infectious. Uh, we don't have a cure and it's still out there. It's true that San Antonio has done a fantastic job of flattening the curve and we are doing well by all of the parameters that we're monitoring. But a note of caution, there's a little uptick um, and if you look at the state of Texas, Steve, I'm kind of concerned that the hospitalization rate, if you look back to mid-April to you know May 17th, there is not a decrease in COVID hospitalizations in Texas. There is not. If anything, there's a it's flat to a slight uptick. And so the testing will be a little deceptive because it depends what you get depends on how many tests you do and who you're testing. So if you run around and really ramp up testing in congregate settings, meaning where people, lots of people congregate, nursing homes and jails, you're gonna find more positive cases and that may or may not reflect badness. But if you look at hospitalizations, those, those you can't be faked out by that. If you get really sick with COVID, you land in the hospital. And the fact that the COVID cases across the state, the hospitalizations, are the same to slightly up um, from mid-April tells me that we're not doing as well as we should be doing and people need to still take this very seriously and be very careful. Now, you're gonna go out, what do you wanna look for? Remember, people drink when people drink alcohol, our inhibitions go down. So all of that self-monitoring that you do, or you're trying to remember not to touch your face, you're trying to remember to wash your hands, you're trying to remember to keep your distance, that's going to be a lot harder to do under the influence of alcohol. Even just one or two drinks can decrease your inhibitions. And so that is a problem. What you want to watch for is have these establishments that you're visiting taken the Greater Safer Together pledge are they practicing social distancing? Does your server wear a mask? Are they asking you the question, the screening questions at the door? How far apart are the tables? How many people are at a table? Is hand sanitizer visible everywhere? And how loud is it? And, and that's something that maybe people don't know intuitively, but when we speak, the louder we speak, or if we yell or scream or sing, we, we aerosolize more respiratory particles. And that's a, a warning sign. So if I were to go into any kind of eating establishment, bar or restaurant, if it, look, if it sounded really loud to me, I would be deterred. I think that people who get their seating outdoors are really onto something. And I heartily encourage all of our bar owners and restaurant owners who can do it to try to move more of their seating outdoors and make sure there's good spacing in between the groups. 
You mentioned that pledge, that Greater Safer Together pledge. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How many businesses that you're aware of that are signed up for this here locally? You know, I don't have the numbers on that, but the economic transition team is the group that came up with that motto. And this is posted on the website, the city of San Antonio's website. If you Google the um, economic transition team, uh, you can find more about that. I, I do happen to know off the top of my head that our grocery store chain, HEB, is is in the mix there, um, as are a number of other establishments, large and small but give them some time. And I think that it will be the thing to do. And I hope San Antonians will request it, will uh, expect it, and that businesses will take it up and really live up to it. Because you know what? This is about taking care of each other. We want these businesses to open successfully. We don't want to have to backtrack. So we all have to take care of each other, which means being careful. Dr. Berger, we're running out of time. I want to ask you about asymptomatic testing. That seems to be the big thing that people are talking about. What does it mean? And perhaps most importantly, who should get it? Yeah, so um, if you, you can, anybody can get a test now. I wouldn't do it randomly. I would think carefully about how the test will change what you're doing and think about people that may be around you that need protection. So if you found out, if you had a reason to think you were positive, like you traveled, you went on an airplane somewhere, you came back, and maybe you live around people who are older and therefore at risk, you know, that might be someone who should go get tested. Anybody who takes care of older folks should get tested. And, and think really about who's the at-risk group, and it's the over 64-year-old set. That's how I'd use it. And when, if you have a positive test and you're asymptomatic, there's specific guidelines from the CDC about how long you need to stay in isolation. And the quick answer to that is 10 days. An asymptomatic person who has a positive test should stay out of circulation for 10 days unless they're an essential healthcare worker or something like that. All right. Dr. Ruth Berggren, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again at 9 o'clock. Yep. And on the night beat. Thank you, doctor. We'll be right back. It's crazy. It's a huge spectacle. I haven't seen this many people together in a while. Yeah, a black bear causing a bit of social distancing disaster in a New Jersey neighborhood. The animal was keeping its distance. <laughs> it was caught on camera strolling down the street in Milburn. The humans that came out to see that bear did not keep their distance. After lumbering down the street Monday morning, that bear climbed up in a tree, stayed there all day. People came out of their houses to take pictures or just get a look. The police showed up to break up the crowds. Parks and Wildlife actually took the bear back to where it wouldn't draw such an audience. Hey, not every day you see a bear in a tree, well, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Let's take a live look outside with live cam right now. Kind of hazy out there and uh, very hot, Adam. Yeah, hazy, hot and humid outside today. The humidity really stuck around, so we didn't make it into the upper 90s here in San Antonio. We st we topped out at 96 degrees and tomorrow I do think we'll be just a few degrees lower at about 94 and then we'll continue to see those high temperatures fall off ever so gradually and we'll be back down in the 80s for highs by this upcoming weekend. But with that should be some enhanced rain chances. So let's talk about everything, starting with the heat. Outside right now, you take a look at the temperature map, and for the most part, we're still in the 90s. You get farther south and west of San Antonio, we've got some readings at the century mark, especially Carrizo Springs and Catula earlier today. Take a closer look at those numbers, and there you have it. 90, oh, you know, we're going to take a closer look at those numbers in just a minute, okay? We're going to take a quick commercial break. See you soon. All right, so with the weather situation, yeah. hot, but... Not record breaking. Yeah, on the plus side. Yeah. And hopefully get some rain later this week, maybe, fingers crossed. Yeah, I think so. I think our, our chances are at least there for later this week and particularly into the upcoming weekend. And I know the timing is not ideal for uh, storms and rainfall being Memorial Day holiday coming up, but uh, we can't control that. And the way it looks right now is we may have to enhance those chances a bit. We'll jump into that in a second, though. First of all, Del Rio actually 108. This is 107. The updated data is 108 for the high temperature, breaking the old record by four degrees. Pleasanton topped out at 99, and here in San Antonio, actually 96 
was our high temperature. OK, take a look at these local readings. There we go. Look at that. New Braunfels at 96 Canyon Lake at 89. Not quite as hot there. Divine, though, checking it at 100 and Pleasanton still 98. So we're feeling the heat out there. Feels like summertime here in South Texas and you get farther west and southwest of town over 100. Cotula Creso Springs 102. So dew points are still up right near 70 degrees. So we're feeling the mugginess out there. Not only is the it the heat, but it's also the humidity. Where dew points are lower, the air temperature or the air really heats up more efficiently. That's why it's warmer farther west of San Antonio and west of I-35. It's not as muggy there. But when you factor in the humidity here in town, it feels like it's six degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. Feels like 101. New Braunfels feels like 103. Pleasanton feels like 104. You get the idea there. As for activity, it's all in West Texas here. That's where it is. Some showers and storms flaring up. Nothing severe, nothing to worry about. This is just typical terrain circulations. But I do think this is the beginning of a trend and a pattern. I think from here on out the rest of the week, we're going to see a lot of this activity in the evenings, and then we could get the leftovers of it pretty much any night this week, except for tonight. Tonight we're not going to see it, but the rest of the nights we could have some of the leftovers. So first our pattern, the real upper level energy is over the West Coast and moving over the East Coast and basically the eastern third of the nation. That's where we have the big upper level swirls and dips. They've got good moisture, a lot of precipitation. That's a cool system too. Temps only in the 60s underneath that. Meanwhile here, wedged in between, the big ridge we have and the heat high that's going to be breaking down. So we're not going to see one of those large scale disturbances move in. But as the heat high breaks down, it opens the door for little ripples in the upper level flow to move through little disturbances and enough to kickstart some showers and thunderstorms. So here's a look at our future cast for tomorrow. We start the day cloudy, low clouds in the morning afternoon sunshine and by the late afternoon early evening we'll probably see some more storms flare up in west texas and even in mexico then as we go through the night there is the possibility that we get those leftovers which is what we saw a lot of last week where we got that those nighttime showers and thunderstorms typically not severe but leftovers will take it it's not a great chance but it's something it's a shot so starting tomorrow night we basically have nightly chances of leftover storms or showers coming in from West Texas. 72 in the morning tomorrow, 94 by the afternoon. After the morning clouds will have a lot of sunshine. A southeast really breeze at 5 to 15. And not only do we have those nightly slight chances of leftover showers, but also we could see a few rogue pop up after noon storms starting on Thursday, lasting through Saturday. If something does, if it's capable of developing, it would run the chance of being strong to severe. By Sunday and Monday, a little extra kick in the atmosphere is boosting our chances to about 40% right now. But if everything basically stays consistent in what we're seeing, we'll be increasing those chances for Sunday and Memorial Day. All right. Thanks so much, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. While some businesses are in the reopening phase, the convention center is still not allowed to host conventions or trade shows. And the governor is literally looking around the world for ideas on that safe way to open. We're looking at, at talking to those businesses in Texas, but we're also uh, looking at, to see uh, the way that some of these operations work nationwide and globally. Hotels uh, that we have spoken to uh, are ready to get back up and running again. Uh, they just need to find uh, the timing, if you would, for it, uh, such that they would be able to open up in a way that they can make some money as opposed to lose money. San Antonio police are looking for a suspect they say shot a teenager in the ankle during a drive-by shooting early this morning. It happened in the 3500 block of Southton View that's on the far east side. It was just before 2 o'clock this morning. SAPD says the male teen was grazed by some shotgun pellets during the shooting. They say he was not taken to the hospital. The suspect got away in a white vehicle. At last check, police were still trying to find the person responsible. JCPenney has announced it plans to close at least 
least 240 locations, which is about 30% of its stores. The retail giant filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy last week. There have been some reports that Amazon and JCPenney are in talks about a collaboration, but it's not clear what those plans are right now. South Texas Blood and Tissue Center running low on blood and can use your help. Right now, the center is down to a two-day inventory. They say the need has increased 49% the past week, likely due to elective surgeries resuming across the state. A three-day blood drive at the Alamo Dome starts Thursday. Donors will receive a $10 HEB gift card, and for every donation, $5 will be donated to the San Antonio Food Bank. A family on the north side staying with some friends for the next couple of days after a garage fire this afternoon. Fire crews giving the call to the 5,000 block of Near Avenue about three. Fire officials say a family member saw smoke inside after opening the door. Everyone made it out okay. Firefighters were able to keep the fire contained to the garage, luckily, but there was some smoke damage to the house. The damage estimate about $20,000. So tomorrow we'll have a good amount of sunshine after we get rid of the morning clouds. 72 in the morning, 94 by the afternoon. Looking at rain chances, they jump up to about 30%, so just isolated in nature. Thursday through Saturday, then Sunday into Monday, we raise them a little bit more scattered, and we could be increasing those rain chances as the days go by and we get uh, more information. So something to keep an eye on for the holiday weekend. Temperature-wise, looks like those highs will be dropping off from 94 tomorrow to near 90 Thursday and Friday, then back down into the 80s for highs this upcoming weekend. Thank you, Adam, and thanks for watching the news at 6. We'll see you back here on the night beat at 10 and, of course, online at 9.